that whenever Mark Stein is on the show, on any show, frankly, the audience figures just multiply. It's a thing of beauty, as is author and broadcaster Mark Stein. He joins me from, I don't know, New York or somewhere like that. How are you? Hey, great to be with you, Michael. And yes, I am in the flesh pots of Manhattan today. Oh, goodness me. Uh, is there any future for American conservatism, by the way? <laughs> Uh, I think so, but I, I think the idea that the white knight uh, on his charger is going to ride in and spearhead the movement has been pretty much clobbered by the uh, the primary process. Yeah, I mean, these some of these people, they're not unimpressive, and I, you've met them, and when you meet them one-to-one, -one, I mean, they're, 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 they're quite overwhelming in a way, but they're not particularly conservative, and they're trimming like crazy to get certain constituencies on their side, but anyone surely, though, better than Barack Obama. Yeah, I, I think th I think that's true. I mean, I think the problem with and and as you say, all of them have uh, fine qualities uh, in, individually. Uh, Rick Santorum, for example, uh, is splendid on the social issues, but he's when it comes to the spending side, the fiscal conservative uh, conservatism, he's a kind of big government. Uh, social conservative, which is what bothers me. He's way too close to the compassionate conservatism of the George W. Bush era. Uh, if, if you, uh, similarly with uh, Ron Paul, I like all the stuff about the Federal Reserve. Uh, I'd be interested in driving a stake through the Federal Reserve uh, and that side of it. But when he starts talking about uh, an isolationist republic uh, living in Fortress America uh, and paying no heed to the rest of the world, I think he's off the charts. If you could take about 25 percent of the the best 25 percent of the four remaining Republican candidates and create a composite in a lab somewhere, uh, in theory you might have something, but the way this primary season's going, it's more likely you'd have the ultimate kind of Republican version of the Frankenstein monster and it would all go horribly wrong. Mm. A lot of predictions have been proved wrong as well. At this stage, I suppose it's still hard to tell, but who do you think will be the man? Well you, well, you know, at, at this stage, uh, Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of resigned to making do. Um, if, if you were putting in a want ad, the best kind of want ads uh, attract uh, the relatively small number of people who are qualified to do the job. If, if things, uh, if they're not quite that well drawn up, you attract a thousand people uh, and the audition process winnows them down and you eventually wind up with the guy who should be doing the job. The problem here, I think, is that the Republican nominating process sets tests which are no measure of who would make a great president in crisis times. Mm. Uh, I think uh, spending your time going door to door in 99 Iowa counties uh, and winning the, the preposterous Iowa caucuses is not actually uh, a way of telling who would be the best chief executive uh, of a country that has officially $16 trillion of debt and another $100 trillion in, uh, in, li in potential liabilities. Mm. The... I suppose it, it, it's a boring way to approach politics, but if you put ideology aside, the most practical person who can have the courage, the tenacity and the experience to, to grip hold of the economic challenges, and they're the main ones at this point, and, and just say enough is enough. It's going to take years to turn this around, but so, we actually have to stop going backwards. Romney, for all of his lack of conservatism, he does understand economics, he does understand business, does he not? Well, yes, but the only time he's been uh, a chief executive in a political sense has been in Massachusetts, mm. and there he left no trace except to make things worse. Yeah. Uh, Romney Care is uh, is in a sense the pi the pilot program for Obamacare, which is uh, what got most people riled up uh, over the over the Tea Party years in two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten. Anyone, if you live in northern New Hampshire, as I do, you know that when you go to uh, hospitals in northern New Hampshire and northern Vermont, they're, they're uh, often full of Quebec patients who can't get timely treatment uh, in their own country. Now in southern New Hampshire, uh, the doctors are getting a windfall from Massachusetts patients who can't get to see a general practitioner in their own state. Uh, Romney, uh, as I said, in, in Massachusetts, Romney left no trace except in the few areas he did, he made things worse. Romney needs a big idea. You know, he, he looked if you don't mind the whole kind of 1950s department store mannequin thing, he looks like a president. Everyone agrees he's got presidential hair. 
But these are critical times, and he needs a big idea, as big as uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher did in 1979 with her selling off the council houses in the United Kingdom, as big as the first generation of uh, post-Sovietization uh, uh, leaders did in the Warsaw Pact countries in the early 1990s, as big as uh, Roger Douglas's uh, privatization program in New Zealand in the 1980s. He needs something big, and right now he has, he's running on his hair, and the hair isn't enough. Is Gingrich willing to be shaped by the big ideas around him? Because I've seen this man change. Quite clever, quite funny, did well when it came to, to attacking the media. But he, he is a, how shall I put this, he's a trimmer. He, he is willing to be influenced by those people he thinks can put him into office. That might not be such a bad thing, though. Well, somebody said that uh, Newt has uh, 100 ideas and 97 of them are brilliant and three of them would blow up the world. Uh, I think it, I think that's not actually the way it breaks down. He has a hundred ideas, uh, seventy-five of them are crazy, yeah. uh, and twenty of them are kind of okay if he sticks to them, and five of them are a absolutely solid and brilliant. And he has ideas for everything. I mean, you, you yeah. know the way it is in politics in the Western world these days, Michael. Everybody is concerned about staying on message. Newt can't stay on message. He's got a bazillion messages. One minute he's uh, talking about uh, brain science. The next minute he's talking about sending federal marshals to arrest judges he doesn't like. The next minute he's talking about putting uh, giant mirrors in space to light uh, American interstates at night. I mean, he's got, he's got solutions to problems people didn't even know were problems. Problems. So as well as an open marriage, he has an open mind. Yes, that's, that's true. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that I think that's true. He, he actually has a kind of open marriage with ideas. Uh, the, pro the problem is he doesn't he doesn't he's disinclined to stay loyal and faithful. Uh, to, I mean, we're overextending this man. If ever, which <laughs> yes. since we're here, we might as well go for it. He, 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 he's disinclined to to stay faithful to one idea till death of Stupart. And he likes fooling around with all kinds of other ideas on the side. That that is his problem there. I think we did that one rather well. So when we come back, I want to ask you uh, about uh, Italian maritime courage and matters related. Stay with us, please. <laughs> now, we can make all sorts of jokes uh, about uh, the history of, of Italian martial arts. I suppose that's the appropriate term. Look, Italian su uh, submarine force, Second World War, incredibly courageous. Uh, the Italian fleet sunk at Taranto, but it was outdated. They didn't even know the British were coming in there archaic biplanes to do all the damage. Mark Stein, author, go to his website, broadcaster, terrific guy. Mark, you wrote a piece, it was very good, very funny, uh, about the, the, the sinking of this ship. It's a tragedy and how the Italians have reacted. The Italians are very angry and very ashamed at this one particular captain. But this notion of saying women and children first, I think it's wonderful. I think it's the quintessence of, uh, of honour and decency, but it's very, very politically incorrect, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I, I, and I think, uh, in a sense, it's fascinating to me. You, you, you've just been uh, over in London. Uh, if you read the comments of The Guardian, the kind of house paper of the, uh, of the British left, uh, they're terribly confused about this yeah. because uh, at the same uh, 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 women, women uh, you, anyone knows this if you uh, if you're at a restaurant and you happen to hold a, a door open for uh, uh, a woman and she happens to be a, a, a hatchet faced feminist and she scowls at you because she doesn't think you should be holding the door open for her for some of some of us are so out of it that this stuff is uh, is instinctive mm. but at the same time uh, at the same time, I do not think a world in which men shove aside women and children to get on board the lifeboat uh, is a, a, an improvement or a progression from the world of uh, the Titanic 100 years ago, uh, where the men stood stiffly on deck, uh, kissed their wives goodbye, watched their wives and children climb into the lifeboats and waved to them as they sailed away and then had... Uh, one last cigar and uh, and a uh, cocktail and went down with the ship. 97% uh, of the uh, women in first class on the Titanic survived. I think it was something like 86% in second class and a little less in third class. But essentially, uh, that code of women and children first uh, endured across all classes, all strata of society in 1912. Uh, and I think in that sense, that's why uh, what happened on the Costa Concordia may be uh, a metaphor for a kind of broader loss of social solidarity. Right. I think that's very well put. And 
George Bernard Shaw, of course, a socialist playwright, we've named a, a festival after him in, in Canada, which is a disgrace. The man was a social engineer and believed in, in, in mass right. murder. He tried to contradict the, the truth about the Titanic, but it was incredibly noble. And, and it might sound cliche, we, we're almost embarrassed by it today, but men did say, off you go, a kiss on the cheek, and, and that th they would stand there, and if they could get off, they would, but they had to put others first. I don't know many women who would say, well, yeah, but that's, that's no, no, let me die, please, because I'm equal with you. Very few, unless they are so ideological, they're almost absurd. Well, you know, I, I get, uh, I usually write about this, this theme uh, on the anniversary of the Montreal Massacre. Uh, which, as you know, was a, a, not the Costa Concordia, uh, but uh, actually in, uh, in, in Montreal at the Ecole Polytechnique, uh, where uh, a, a guy walks into a classroom with a gun, and he tells the men to go to one side and the women to go to uh, the other side, and then he orders the men to leave the room, and they all leave the room, and they stand in the corridor, and then he fires on the women and kills most of them, and then even as he walks out into the corridor, uh, none of the the the, the so-called men try to stop him. And yeah. every time I write about this, uh, I get a ton of mail from saying, oh, yeah, like, you're such a big macho guy, you little fairy pants writer, you. You'd be wetting your knickers just like everybody else. And, and uh, maybe I would. So what? It's better to have a social norm. Uh, it's a better society that has a social norm uh, that individual panty waist uh, writers and commentators like me fail to live up to than have a, a society with no social norms whatsoever uh, that lets what uh, happened at the Ecole Polytechnique or in the sinking of the MV Estonia uh, in the Baltic uh, in the 90s, when, again, men, uh, men climbed over crippled women and children uh, to get out of the ship. They climbed over scared, terrified children. Uh, uh, they, uh, a, a woman uh, was begging. She, she couldn't walk, and she was begging for a life belt. Nobody gave her one. Mm -hmm. that is, there is a profound loss to society, uh, and we are not a more attractive society for going along with that. Yes, and, and it's not about gender, per se. It's about perceptions of who is weaker and who, and who, who deserves and needs help. So maybe we develop a society where male and female are Equal. But if you think a person, for whatever reason, should be given aid, to not give that aid, to say, no, I want to, to be the first one, my life is more important, is a complete breakdown of what we thought was civil and civilized for, for thousands of years. Well, the, well the, these things get to the glimpse, I think, of, uh, of what we have become. We are really the first, uh, what we should really call sex neutral, but today they say gender neutral society. Yeah. And you would have to say uh, that, that, for the most part, women are better at being men than men are at being uh, women. Women uh, have, uh, have gone on to, uh, if you go to law schools in most of the Western world now, they're dominated by female students. Uh, women have done very well at this. If you look at the recession uh, in most of the Western world, it's, it's really what they call a he-session, mm. uh, in which men... Uh, men with skills that are often, in many cases, obsolescent. Uh, there's no work for them to do, and they're the ones, and they're the ones stuck at uh, home. Uh, in other words, women are uh, in this brave new world. Women are better at being men than men are at being women. And and what I worry about uh, in in when you see glimpses of uh, what we've become on the Costa Concordia is uh, that we, we all know this business about, oh, the Western world right. is like the Titanic sailing okay. for the iceberg. What if we're sailing like the iceberg and we're like the Costa Concordia? Yeah, I, I think, think that's the real issue. Okay. Mark, I wish we had more time. A great pleasure. Thank you so very much, my friend. Always a pleasure, Michael.